G'day everyone, my name's Lucas and like a wild koala spreading rampant chlamydia throughout the Australian bush, so too will I be spreading information to guide you through the online digital jungle. Surely you've encountered computer viruses more than once. Most often, cyber criminals use them to make money. For example, they might unbeknownst to you, turn your laptop or smartphone into a digital zombie, an element of a botnet. The infected device is engaged in additional tasks, for example, mining cryptocurrency, sending spam messages, or even participating in attacks on other websites. If the program is written correctly, then it can be very tricky to be noticed. Only indirect signs show it. Increasing traffic, rapid battery discharge, or the processor overheating. And until you notice the problem, the attacker will be making money from your device. But there is a fundamentally different class of hacker programs. They're not about hiding, but about aggressively attacking. Their task is to cause maximum damage to your computer system. So hold on to your hard drives and keep your nuclear code secret. We're about to jump into cyber warfare weapons of the 21st century, combat viruses. Most of us associate the word Chernobyl with the disaster at the Soviet nuclear plant in Ukraine. It's now clear that the Soviet Union has suffered one of the worst disasters in the history of nuclear power. In 1986, a reactor explosion and radioactive contamination claimed hundreds of lives and made thousands of kilometers of northern Ukraine uninhabitable. Now, this tragedy has become a turning point in the development of nuclear energy around the world. But experts in the field of computer security associate this word with a completely different event. On April 26, 1999, exactly 13 years after the Chernobyl explosion, half a million computers around the world were attacked by a virus that was fundamentally different from their predecessors. First, it destroyed the user's files, and then it erased the program that manages the computer's boot function. Hello. It's called the BIOS. Unlike documents or photos, this program is not located on the disk, but in the memory of the motherboard. If you erase the BIOS, the computer simply will not start, and it's impossible to restore the program without special equipment. Computer repair services couldn't cope with the flow of customers. Many just had to buy new computers. So the virus, later called WinCIH or Chernobyl, crossed the line between digital and real world. This was the first time a program was created to physically disable other computers. Experts promptly investigated the attack and they found its author. Fortunately, the initials and references to Tartong University were left in the virus code. Through this, we now know that Chernobyl was written by a 24 year old Chinese student, Chen Ying Yao. Ironically, the reason for creating the program was the self-confidence of the manufacturers of antivirus programs. In advertising, see, they claimed that they were able to withstand any threats. Chen Yingyo decided to prove this was not the case. He couldn't begin to imagine how vulnerable the computer world would be. I accept that challenge. The virus got into the web in the summer of 98. It didn't perform any suspicious actions, and so it went unnoticed by the creators of antiviruses. The program was distributed along the chain from computer to computer to computer, and was waiting for April 26th to strike all over the world. System administrators were in a panic. They had not yet encountered such a threat before. Rumors spread like wildfire on the internet about programs that spun up hard drives so fast they would overheat. Someone wrote that you could configure the video card so that it would burn out the monitor. There was even an urban legend about a computer virus that kills people, displaying a picture that would cause seizures and epilepsy, just like that bad episode of Pokemon did. By the way, contrary to another legend, the date of activation of the CIH virus is not related to the Chernobyl disaster. Chen finished creating the virus on April 26, 98, and he gave it exactly one year to spread. So it's just a coincidence. Still, the Chinese student did not expect such an effect. 
Seeing the scale of the disaster, he actually joined and worked with the team that wrote the antidote module. Charges were brought against Chen in court, but he didn't violate any concrete laws at the time. The end of the trial left a lot of unanswered questions. In the meantime, this didn't prevent Chen from working as a developer in large electronic manufacturers. So if your computer has a motherboard or video card with a Gigabyte technology logo, you know that this legendary agent of chaos participated in its creation. Now, the US, Chinese and Russian security services were obviously interested in this. They were starting to develop viruses of their own for war in cyberspace. It sounds like a corny tech film from the 1990s, but it's not. This is real history. In 2010, Iran was close to creating its first atomic bomb. The processing plant in Natanz worked around the clock in huge machines. Radioactive uranium was being purified from excess impurities. Now, this is kind of similar to the work of the spinning that goes on in a washing machine, only it's not water that's being squeezed out, but the basis of a future bomb. The plant employed 5,000 such centrifuges. The incident at Natanz comes a day after the Iranian government on Saturday announced plans to launch over 150 new uranium centrifuges at the plant. Suddenly, one of the machines was destroyed. The drum, which at the time was spinning at a speed of 50,000 revolutions per minute, broke away from its place and swept up everything in its path. After a few minutes, the same thing happened with another drum, then another, then another. Engineers frantically were trying to urgently stop the centrifuges, but the machines didn't respond to the computer commands. Explosions then were heard throughout the premise, and the complex was quickly filled with uranium hexafluoride. When they finally de-energized the complex, more than 1,300 centrifuges had already been destroyed. At the same time, similar accidents occurred at another site, the Bashir nuclear power plant which was being prepared for their first launch. The equipment failed for unknown reasons. Due to the destruction of important nodes, the launch of the station was delayed until September next year. In general, Iran's whole nuclear program had been set back several years. Of course, the secret police hunted for the saboteurs, but they did not find any. And this is not surprising. After all, the cause of the problems was a malicious program, Stuxnet, and it was developed by American and Israeli programmers to prevent Iran obtaining nuclear weapons. Stuxnet operated in three stages. First, it infected computers running Windows. Stuxnet is then distributed all over the world. At first, it will be discovered by programmers from Belarus and then on thousands of other computers around the globe. But it didn't cause problems for ordinary users. Its target was exclusively for Semen's hardware, which was being used at Iran's nuclear facilities. Of course, such computers were not connected to the internet. Therefore, phase two, Stuxnet invented the computers of engineers engaged in setting up equipment. They often used USB flash drives to install updates. And through one of these flash drives, the virus entered the network of the processing plants. The program was tiny, its size about half a megabyte, smaller than a digital photo. Stuxnet didn't reveal itself with any unnecessary actions. The only thing it did was look for an automated control system or industrial equipment using Simmons installations. Through it, Stuxnet reprogrammed the centrifuges. The electric motors began to rotate at such a speed that the entire body began to vibrate. The vibration weakened the nuts of the fasting parts, broke its bearings, and then the centrifuges jammed and violently broke away. Outwardly, it looked like a breakdown that was in no way related to the operations of electronics or the control program of the electronic motors. A detailed description of the work of Stuxnet is given in the report by semantic expert Liam O. Murcher. Essentially, yes, what Stuxnet is trying to do is it's trying to uh, slow down or stop the uh, enrichment of uranium, which can be used for uh, atomic bombs. To say this report shocked the world of computer security would be an understatement. We have well and truly entered the era of military operations being conducted in the digital world. The program has managed to do what Israeli aviation failed to do, slow down the nuclear program that threatened both US and Western interests in the Middle East. Like any new weapon being developed, the publicity of Stuxnet 
soon drew the attention of criminals and the possibilities such technology would allow. Already in March 2013, Iran hit back. A group of Izzedin al qassam hackers successfully attacked the computer networks of American Express, JP Morgan, and Bank of America. Previously, criminals used computers to obtain information about their opponents. But now, intelligence was replaced with destruction. The main goal of these types of attacks is to disable high-tech systems. And then, the cyber extortionists also entered the game. Perhaps you've experienced viruses that encrypt your data and then demand money for their recovery. My advice to you, if you are faced with such a problem, do not sponsor intruders, but ask for help from professionals. And it's always better to back up all important data in advance on a separate disk or in a secure cloud service. There is little to gain in paying off these blackmailers as inevitably they'll release your data anyway or ask for even more payments. Unfortunately, not all companies use this advice. So if you live on the East Coast of the US, then this spring you could face the consequences of a successful attack on one of the largest US pipeline systems. I appreciate that you have joined us today to provide answers to the committee and the American people on how a group of criminals was able to infiltrate your networks, steal nearly 100 gigabytes of data in just two hours, and then lock your systems with ransomware to demand payment. Colonial Pipeline delivers fuel and petroleum products from Texas to New York, New Jersey, and 17 other states across 8,500 kilometers, up to 30 million barrels a day are pumped. This is almost half the fuel that the entire East Coast consumes. And on May 7th, 2021, the Colonial Pipeline computer system was attacked by a well-organized group of hackers. Unfortunately, it's always easy to talk about events like these if they happened many years ago, when detailed results of investigations, expert reports, and testimonies of the events appear on the web. We still know relatively little about the attack on the Colonial Pipeline. What we do know for sure is that the company's network was attacked by the DarkSide hacker group. The attackers stole more than 100 gigabytes of critical information, contracts with customers, suppliers, programs to ensure financial transactions, and the control and monitoring of the pipeline itself. Most of the files are copied at first and then encrypted. The attack used the easily adaptable software. Ransom DarkSide is designed to work with Windows and Linux. They use reliable encryption algorithms so it was impossible to return the data without a key. Colonial Pipeline lost control over its own computers and servers. The billing system of the Colonial Pipeline was blocked. The company couldn't issue invoices or even keep records on the shipped fuel. Information security specialists assumed that the equipment of the pipeline itself was under attack. And in order not to repeat the scenario in Iran, the leadership decided to stop the entire system. On May 9th, US Joe Biden was forced to declare a state of emergency. Already by May 13th, 17,000 gas stations were out of fuel. Some gas stations reporting they have no gasoline to sell. Retail gasoline prices were through the roof, a 10 year high and airlines were forced to change their flight schedules. They just didn't have enough fuel for planes on the East Coast. The extortionists demanded a ransom of 75 bitcoins. And despite the first statements to the press, Colonial Pipeline paid the necessary amount. Hackers fulfilled the terms of the deal and gave the company's engineers back their encryption keys with instructions on how to restore their systems. But the story does not end there. During the investigation of the incident, FBI agents managed to establish but the attack on the pipeline was far from the first success of DarkSide. In less than a year, $90 million worth of Bitcoins were transferred to the group's crypto wallets. About 100 companies in all were affected by the hackers' activities. All of them preferred to transfer the required ransom without mm, unnecessary publicity, let's say. However, the management of the Colonial Pipeline was a bit more clever. It involved the FBI experts during the transfer of their Bitcoins, as a result, they managed to return more than 60 of the 75 transferred coins. We can say that the Colonial Pipeline rode out the storm relatively easily, but I think even more high profile crimes are waiting for us ahead. Are we seeing a rise in these types of attacks? 
Yes, particularly over the past year, you mentioned some figures that, that to me, I think add up to this one that we know well, which is 2,400 uh, school systems, governments, and healthcare facilities in 2020 were reportedly the victims of ransomware, and that's only the reported victims. How not to become a victim of these hackers? Even if you give up your computers or smartphones, well, unfortunately, you will not be able to completely protect yourself. You see, our entire civilization has long been hooked on computers. Computers monitor power plants, pipelines, they watch air traffic and traffic control lights. Without computers, it is already impossible to imagine the work of rescue services and military operations. Complex information systems have become a soft underbelly for all mankind. Therefore, I strongly encourage you to take a reasonable attitude to cybersecurity issues. My recommendations are extremely simple. Do not trust the statements of antivirus manufacturers. Absolutely reliable programs do not exist. In none of today's cases have they managed to cope with these threats. Therefore, you should know that even if your antivirus does not see a dangerous program on your system, doesn't mean there are no such programs. Perhaps they, like Chernobyl, are still waiting in the wings. Forget about USB storage devices. Flash drives and removable disks are one of the main channels for transmitting malware. Don't forget that just one flash drive caused more damage to the Iranian program than all of the embargoes and assassinations combined. Finally, carefully monitor the programs for remote access and if possible, completely abandon them. According to one version, Darkseid hackers penetrated the Colonial Pipeline network for the first time simply by using a compromised TeamViewer password. Joey, how are you doing? <laughs> How you doing? What? How you doing? Damn it, Carl. Go wait in the hall. And of course, stay on the Sum Sub channel. There are many more still interesting, mysterious, and truly frightening stories ahead. Now, where did my koala get off to?